I wish you a Merry Christmas. Thanks for joining me today for the most extraordinary Christmas news. I'm Jeff Goodson. It's our practice as a church each year at Christmas time to collect bags of rice and tins of food for a soup kitchen. The soup kitchen is run by one of our sister churches in a township called Lewandle, close to Somerset West. Each week in that community, a little group of volunteers gets together and, and cooks a meal using whatever ingredients they have for the destitute and the hungry in their, in their community. They then have a, a little church service together and people eat together. The volunteers don't get paid. They do it out of a, a genuine love and a concern for the people that they know. They give their time and their efforts freely for the hungry in their community. Rice is, a, is an ingredient that they especially appreciate because it is relatively cheap and you can store it for long periods of time and it, of course, it fills hungry tummies. Peter, the minister there, was telling me recently that your generosity last year meant that this soup kitchen ran for four months just on our gifts alone. So a super big thank you to you for supporting our Ricemas tree again this year. Give yourselves a, a, a pat on the back or, or give the person that you're sitting next to a, a, a pat on the back or a, a round of applause. Now, in honor of our rice collection, I thought that I'd ask you a rice question today. I thought maybe I would put up a prize for the brain box who knows the answer, but I suspect that most of us have way too much chocolate in the house already. And so all you're going to get for answering my question today is the honor. Don't underestimate the honor. Everyone will look at you with deep respect if you know the answer to my initial question. You ready? Here it is. How many grains of rice are there in this two kilogram bag of rice? Well, that's quite hard. So I thought that in uh, who wants to be a millionaire kind of style, I'll give you five options. Yeah, yeah, they are. Is it A, 100 grains of rice, B, 1,000 grains of rice, C, 10,000, D, 100,000, E, a million. How many grains of rice are there in a two kilogram bag of rice? You can easily knock off A, so it's either B, C, D, or E. Anyone want to phone a friend? Now, of course, the answer depends on the weight of a single gram of rice. So I'm told that most rice weighs about 0.02 grams per grain, which then makes the answer, well, obviously, D. There are about 100,000 grains of rice in a two kilogram bag which incidentally makes a 20 kilogram bag of rice about a, a million grains of rice. Now, if I take four two kilogram bags of rice, I've only got three, each with 100,000 grams in them, I have roughly 400,000 grams of rice. And it's that number that I want us to consider today. To be more precise, 385,000. That's the number, according to the United Nation, of babies that are born every day in our world. About five babies are born every second of every day so that there are about 385,000 bundles of joy born somewhere across the world each day. One of those was you, each with their big eyes and their ugly prune-shaped faces, each screaming for food and snuggling with that unmistakable, delicious, and sometimes not so delicious baby smell. 385,000 babies are born every day. Now, question number two. If you wanted to draw attention to just one of those babies, how would you do it? How would you go about it? I put one grain of rice in a packet for us to identify. Here he is. If you wanted the whole world to know about and focus in on this one grain of rice, what would you do? Say you were appointed marketing executive for this one grain of rice. How would you go about telling the whole world about it? Would you make a TikTok video with a rice dance and perhaps try to get it to go viral? Or, or put a leaflet in every home? Take, take out an ad at the Super Bowl or at the Soccer World Cup final? Would you get CNN, BBC, and Al Jazeera, and Ian CA to come and to film this one grain of rice? How did you choose to get one baby born known in all of human history? Now, as you're pondering my second question, let me ask you a third, and that is this. Why should you care? Why should you care about one grain of rice? Why, why bother about one baby born amongst 385,000 babies that are born every single day? It's Christmas time. Mistletoe and wine, children singing Christmas rhymes. Church going is a, a tradition at Christmas, and we thank you for choosing St. Stephen's to watch or to attend this year. Every minister prattles on about baby Jesus, but why should you care? 
Uh, why not sleep in a little, next, a little later next Christmas? I think that's an important question to consider. And I think the answer to that comes from considering your worst nightmare. So my fourth question today is, what is your worst nightmare? Would it be being trapped underground in a dark and confined space like those miners in India? Or like that soccer team a few years ago in Thailand? Can you imagine the horror of that? Oh, or how about being stuck in a lift that's plummeting to the earth as this so tragically happened at Impala Platinum Mines recently? For your worst nightmare, how about being stuck in a broken cable car dangling high above Table Mountain with the wind blowing you backwards and forwards? Or being washed out to sea by a riptide? Or standing on a sinking ship like the Titanic? Or being on an aeroplane as the jet engines cut out one by one? Perhaps your worst nightmare might be being covered in angry bees or, or finding a snake in your bed or, or being bitten by a shark. There are all sorts of scenarios that are just, well, just plain horrifying. Please forgive me if I've, I've triggered you because I know that many of you have had tragedies like these come really close to you. The stark reality of being stuck in any of those terrible scenarios is that in each and every one of them you'll need rescuing. You can't save yourself. You just can't. Your money won't be able to save you, nor your fame, nor your influence, nor your looks, nor your anything, really. Sometimes in life, the truth is we just need a saviour. The Bible says that our world needs a saviour. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't. When things are going swimmingly well, we, we don't think we need anything at all, other than perhaps a bit more money. But when Russia invades your hometown, or Hamas, or the IDF strikes, or COVID comes, or out of nowhere you get brutally mugged in the street, or your partner hits you, or depression descends, or, or death comes close. Well, then we start to consider that just maybe the Bible might be right. Perhaps we do need a saviour to rescue us in this world. We've tried political parties, and pretty much every week there's a new one. Rise of Mzansi, Borsa, Spectrum Party, just this week, and Konto we sees where, but... They just seem to make things worse. We've tried our heroes. And perhaps for a few moments they've, they've helped us to forget. But the high of, of winning a World Cup doesn't seem to last and it doesn't really help. We've tried pleasure and, and pleasure's nice but in the moment, but, but it too just doesn't seem to last. And so when we're really thoughtful, there's this haunting realisation that it's true. We do actually need a saviour. And the staggering declaration of Christmas is that God has sent him. Here's the story again. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered except each to his own town. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. That's all really familiar territory to us. It might just be worth being reminded that it's not history a la Hollywood, Napoleon, the movie, has, uh, has just been re released. This is how one critic described the Hollywood-style history of that particular movie. Uh, quote, lazy, pointless, boring, migraine-inducing, too short, and historically inaccurate. Today, we're not reading some truth like that. Now, Caesar Augustus was a real ruler. There are all sorts of statues of him in museums around the world. You can look them up. L Luke says this event took place when he reigned. National Geographic described Caesar Augustus as one of ancient Rome's most successful leaders. He led the transformation of Rome from a republic to an empire. During his reign, Augustus restored peace and prosperity to the Roman state, and he changed nearly every aspect of Roman life. The historians amongst us will know that Augustus followed Julius Caesar after a fight with Mark Antony. When Augustus was Caesar, a man and a woman trudged the 150-odd kilometers to a little village called Bethlehem. They did it because it was the law. They had to be counted, almost certainly for tax purposes. It was not a journey you undertook out of joy. Yeah, I'm going to go and register for tax. 
And you can imagine that walking 150 kilometers when you're nine months pregnant is it's pretty likely to bring on the birth of the child. And so a child was born. J just one child amongst a whole heap of other children. J just one child born in the same way that five children are born every second of every day. On that day, a child was born. We're told very little about that birth. Presumably it happened the way that births happen. It was messy and painful and you don't emerge from a birth with terribly much dignity. The baby was born. Joseph probably cut the umbilical cord, they cleaned up the baby as best they could, wrapped him in some rags that they managed to find and then put him to sleep in a cattle feeding trough. Because the only inn in the town, well, it was chock-a-block full. And if that was all that had happened, we wouldn't be gathering on Christmas. We'd probably all be at work, first day of the week, grumbling about Mondays, getting the kids ready for school. It was just a birth, an ordinary birth. But God wants you to know that there was something special about this one. He, he wants every person that ever lives to know about this baby born. And so his marketing strategy began by sending some angels to some shepherds. What? <laughs> well, let me read that to you again. This is verse 8 of Luke chapter 2, and in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. No marketing manager, no CNN, no influencers, no gender reveal on Instagram, no paparazzi, no one famous or influential invited. God sends some messengers to some shepherds, stinky shepherds, sleeping rough, probably not terribly well educated. As John said, John said last week at our carol service, uh, shepherds are not the people you want your daughter to marry. We don't pray, dear Lord, I pray that she marries a shepherd. On that night when Caesar Augustus reigned, God said to some shepherds, wakey, 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 wake up. Because today the Savior of all humanity has been born, been born. And if you go to Bethlehem, you'll see him with your own eyes. And so they went. And what they found was a baby in a manger. No carols being sung softly. No Christmas trees. No wise men. Those all came much later. No mince pies or presents or tinsel. No table set with gammon uh, and turkey. Just a baby. Most men are pretty awkward around babies. We try and be polite with gritted teeth. We say things like, isn't he cute? Even as we're thinking, looks like a prune to me. Hope he gets his mother's looks, not his father's. They saw a baby. And from that moment on, the news started to spread that the Savior of the world had been born. The angel said to those shepherds, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, Christ the Lord. Now, that won't be terribly important to you if you don't think you need saving. Many years ago, Tracy and I were on a road trip. We were going to see some friends. He's a, a building manager and he was working on the development of the exclusive Pinder game reserve in, in northern KwaZulu-Natal. They invited us to come and see and uh, stay for a couple of nights. So I'm a pastor and I'm never getting to a plush luxury game lodge like that in any other way. And so, of course, we said yes. And as we were driving along, we were in the middle of nowhere. The car started to do some rather weird things. We pulled over, I jacked up the back wheel and it promptly fell off. The bearing had stripped. One thing was apparent. We needed saving. We're in the middle of nowhere. The closest hamlet was a little place called Mkuzi. There is nothing in Mkuzi. Then thankfully, someone, a complete stranger, stopped and saved us. Let me tell you two stories that describe our world. Philosophers call these meta-narratives. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, longer than any of us can comprehend, there was nothing. Except that it wasn't quite nothing because there was an infinitely small and dense thing called a singularity. This exploded by chance. And luckily it went from nothing to quite a lot of things. 
These things, mainly hydrogen, began to combine. Overcoming strong repulsive forces that you probably need a PhD to understand, a gravitational force drew all this stuff together into stars. Some of these stars eventually exploded into supernovas, further spreading and reorganizing the nothing. Eventually, after a very, very, very long time, our own planet Earth came from this cosmic mess. And the Earth, well, it was really lucky. Lucky to be just the ideal distance from the right kind of star. Lucky to be tilted at exactly the right angle to create seasons. And luckily, there was a soup of inorganic elements that somehow started to jump together to form amino acids. And some of these were, luckily, of the proper orientation so that they fell into the precise order to form proteins. These proteins, well, they were also very lucky to be folded in such a way so as to be useful to form all the machinery necessary to form cells. From these cells, combining and reproducing over a very long time, Luckily, more complex life came about. Lots of mutations and lots of death, and luckily we end up where we are today. And then our luck ran out, because what emerged was nuclear bombs and wars and global climate disasters, viruses, gender-based violence, crime, corruption, rulers the world over that seem to be mad, and all we seem to get are a few short years before we die. But Christmas sings to us another story. A story of God making it all. And God was really proud of what he made, except that along the journey, something got lost. That something was precious, treasured, wanted, important, and most of all, loved. And what got lost wasn't actually a something, but a someone. It was us. We got lost. We wandered far away from God, and we need help getting back. We need saving. And so much did God love us that he sent his son into the world to be born as that savior. God was born to Mary in that stable that day. And God chose to announce this momentous news to shepherds. Here it is. Just in case you've been sleeping, God came to save you. That, that saving would take him dying on a cross and excruciating death for you. He came to make it possible for us to have life. Not life like this. Not life in this world with all its frustration and all its pain. He came to make sense of our worst nightmares. He came so that this life would... Just be the prelude, the introduction, the preface to the real life of eternity, which is coming. In the second story, you matter. You have meaning. You're valued and treasured and loved. It's a story in which God was born to save you. It's a story of hope. It's a story of life. It's a story of Christmas. I pray that you will embrace this story as your story. If you've never considered that Christmas might actually be personal, that it might actually be for you, that it might be something that you need to act upon, well, I'd invite you. In fact, I'd urge you today to take just one step this Christmas. And that is to commit to reading the whole story. Read the story of Jesus as an adult. Read it with an open heart. You'll find uh, four different accounts in the Bible. They're named after the authors. They're called Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And I challenge you to get hold of a copy and read one of them. The one called Mark is the shortest. The one called Luke was written by a doctor. And the one called John by an artist. Why don't you take it up this Christmas, grab it, and read it as you consider that Jesus might actually have come to save you. If today you've been reminded again of how important Christmas is, then sing. Sing because on that day in the city of David, your Savior was born. He's Christ the Lord. Merry Christmas, everyone. Let me pray for us. There is good news, giving great joy. The Savior is born. He is Christ the Lord. We give you glory and we praise you, our God, for your mercy. And today we pray. We pray for peace on earth and that we might embrace peace with you, even as we embrace your salvation for us. In Jesus' name we pray.